Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hello, Otterites. This is episode 189. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, gentlemen, I am in the captain's chair today. I'm back in the recliner here over in uh, Studio N. Here we're at uh, Martin's place. The comfy chair. The comfy chair. Nobody Nakatomi. expects the yeah. comfy chair. No. <laughs> Nakatomi <laughs> Plaza, 30th floor. Down the hall from Ellis. Just behind the waterfall. Just behind the waterfall. That's right. That's right. So today we are going to be talking, uh, we're going to continue our historical series on the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution. And this is something that has been, you know, my big thing for a while because, you know, we've been, we've been doing all kinds of other stuff. Important stuff, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I've been really wanting to do the Revolution because right. obviously as Americans, this is huge. Yeah, yeah, it took us a long time to get here, but yeah, yeah it's uh, it's good stuff. Good it stuff. is. We and launched last month with kind of melding in the Our Heroes idea with, yes. a, with a George Washington episode yeah. and talked about his greatness and uh, what he meant. And so now this episode, though, is another kind of launch pad type episode. It really is. Uh, we, could have got, we could have done this one first, but uh, especially since, you know... Uh, uh, Washington really is a major figure after, you know, when the revolution starts and then yes. after with the, the forming of the government. But, you know, we had to do Washington last month because it was February. It's February. It's birthday. Yeah. So, uh, but today we're going to do the seeds of the revolution. We're going to talk about that period leading up to hostilities and really a little bit into the hostilities because really the formation is still going on up until 1776 yeah i mean there's still a lot of convincing to be done Uh, until the declaration gets signed it's still a maybe because not everybody is all they have they've made the decision they have to be united or it doesn't work which was a very smart one to do yeah i mean they were they were even quote peace talks after the Declaration was put out, right, yeah, right, uh, Franklin uh, participated in those in New York, but it was pretty brief. It right. Was, well, the Brits wanted to say, "All right, you got to retract the, the Declaration," and they said, "Well, we'll stuff it up your behind first, but yeah. Yeah. we're not retracting it." <laughs> exactly. And uh, and so that was the end talks. of the talks. Yeah. So I mean, talk about the bravery of. Well, we're going to go meet this British general uh, on Staten Island, and. Uh, we're going to tell him to stuff it. Right. It's incredible. Exactly. Example. Well, but you know, if, you, if you're if you going to tell somebody to stuff it, Franklin's the guy you want to have yes. Well, yeah, he's, he's the one that was famous for saying, you know, we, if we better all hang together on this, otherwise we we'll hang, hang separately. separately. Yes. 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 That's, uh, well, and he was the guy that had been dealing with the Brits all along anyways. He, yeah, he, was been, the, he had the talked master to Parliament statesman. many times. You know, they knew who he was. So Yeah, he was we're, we're going to get into that. Yeah. yeah, I definitely want to bring up more about Franklin and his activities and yeah. his... His ideas. So, when we talk about the seeds of the revolution, you know, it doesn't start with the Boston Massacre. Uh, you know, it really, it goes back to the 1760s. And you can yeah. make an argument that it goes back in, even into the 1730s, where that's probably really starts to, to really irritate the colonists. But the 1760s, especially with starting with the Stamp Act, yeah, the Stamp is where it the big really, dog. really takes off. You kind of have a pause in between there with the French and Indian War, uh, which kind of, oh, okay, well, maybe we aren't so bad to be British. Well, uh, they always considered themselves, themselves Englishmen up until the Declaration. Right. So the the thing about the, the, the war itself is actually one of the issues that divided the, the colonies from the Crown, because the Crown was saying, you got to pay for your fair share. That's right. It's like, dude. We did pay our fair share. Yeah, right. We bled. We put as many men in the field over here as you did and, and it, funded it. Yeah, at their own cost. And, and uh, yeah, we, we need to talk more about that. But let's let's start with, I think, one of the first incidents is, I think it was called the King Philip's War. Yes. It was, you know, a conflict against the native tribes. Yep. Um, that, again, the Brits are saying, hey, we're protecting you from all of this. And the colonists are saying, well, not really. We we formed our own militias, right? We we funded all that stuff, and we we went ahead and fought for ourselves. Um, and so there was already right from the beginning kind of a defiant streak in all the colonists. Yes, and you know this is a a, 
a big part of the what became you know the, this American mindset or this American character that would develop over time. But it, it's important to remember that almost everybody that was in the colonies had already irritated the crown in one way or another anyway. Right, that's they were all, the whole point. <laughs> yeah, they were all dissenters and ended up over here anyway. So, I mean, you've got Scotch Presbyters in, in North Carolina. you got English Catholics in Maryland. That's right, in Rhode Island. Um, yeah. And you've got Puritans the in Massachusetts. The Puritans so. all up through New England. Yeah, so all through New England. So everybody yeah. was kind of a misfit anyway, and it kind of been run out of Britain. So as Robert put it during show prep, I mean, when you kick all the malcontents to one place, what's going to happen? They're going to remain malcontents. Right. They're, they're just going to be a big band of malcontents <laughs> instead of a bunch of little ones. That's right. And if they ever find common cause, which is ultimately what finally what happened, would happen, yeah. Yeah. then we'll be tied. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about this. I'm glad you brought this up because uh, I, I don't think... And granted, we don't, there's not really... Like, in school, we don't get a whole lot of this stuff. Right. You know, we get like two minutes on the stamp app. Yeah. And then we go straight to the Boston Boston Man- Massacre for a couple of minutes. And a tea party. And a tea party. And, 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 and then, then Lexington and Concord. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's, yeah. That's and short, that short really doesn't walk. doesn't do everything we need to, to cover. Yeah, there's a bunch of malcontents. All the colonies are started at various times. You know, they're not all sent over at the same yeah. time. So, but you're right. They are founded by people who have either irritated the crown or the crown would like to get rid of, or they're just looking for opportunities that yeah. do not exist in the ultra stratified. Yes, society. that's a huge part of, of the, the British class structure yes. that you can't break out of. Exactly. You could do that in the colonies. Exactly. If you had talent, if you had ability, the opportunity was there to make something of your life. And what the crown never understood. And honestly, I, I, I doubt any, very many people today understand this, is that when you send a bunch of people that want to get away from you, and you send them as communities, you know, unlike yeah. with Australia, you know, that wasn't large communities they sent over as groups to found new settlements. Right? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of more dis- disparate types of people, Canada, Australia, other Well, places. Canada it wasn't even British at first. Yeah. So... You know, that's one of the things that the, the Americans, uh, the colonies, miscalculated. When they invaded Ontario, they thought, oh, they'll join us. It's like, no, they come from a different background entirely, and it just wasn't happening. Yeah. That's why that failed. But when you, when you look at the whole concept of sending people over to what is essentially an untamed wilderness, yeah. they have to build everything from scratch. Yeah. Now, they bring supplies, they bring knowledge, and they get supplies and new people from mother country, but they're doing all the work themselves. Nobody's coming in there, and yes, doing it for them. That's an important part of the colony mindset is also self-reliance. Yes, they have we're, to be. We're deliberately going to a wilderness. We know it's a wilderness, but we want to build it there. Right. Uh, as the pilgrims would, would eventually term it, that shining city on the hill. It, it was meant to be a fresh start, a new beginning for these dissenters who understood they would have to be self-reliant. Exactly. That, in my mind, is the biggest miscalculation that the Brits make, and it's the biggest contributing factor to what it ultimately becomes, it comes to mean, yeah. being an American. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because that self-reliance, that, that, that uh, rugged individualism, even though they didn't call it that then... That's very much yeah. a, 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 a huge factor. Now, it's a rugged individualism, but it's also communal. Yeah. So these communities are very tight knit and they understand that. And so, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's probably one of the best mixes of individualism plus communal responsibility yeah. that you will ever see. Yeah. And that's so important. There's one other social, I will call it this, social factor that, that you also brought up. Um, when we were discussing show prep, that I really think is important too is there's a value on education. Yes. You know, they were dissenters, so they had to kind of study and sharpen their arguments against uh, the Church of England and against the Crown. So learning in in lots of different fashions um, was important. And a person with abilities... Uh, was unfettered 
uh, to explore whether it was classical learning, Greek, Latin, whatever, um, they could do that. Yeah, one of the other things we talked about, uh, Francis missed this because we talked about it on the way to pick you up this morning, Yeah, <laughs> uh, was that the education of a person back then, obviously it's very different. Uh, most of the yeah. highly educated men that we think of as part of the revolution, yes, they were educated in a classical sense, but also they did a massive amount of self-education. Yeah. And it never stopped. You know, they were all readers. They were writers. Hamilton, people like Hamilton especially, from a very, very modest background. Yes. Um, and he was one of these, that not only did he learn sort of that classic stuff, he also immersed himself in business. Yes. In political economy and all of that, and learned all of that as well. Yeah. And one of the, one of the other things we talked about that... Uh, it helps form these men who are, Martin, as you put it, these geniuses that all came together at one point in history, which we've talked about many times, is that it's a perfect storm of, mm. of ideas and people who could act on those ideas. But one of the things that is different about then and now is, one, it's a much more limited curriculum in the sense there's not the hard science and math that we see today. Right. Um, you know, there's much more focus on literature and the classics and what have you. So... It's very much what we experienced at Bellarmine with the liberal arts. It very is a so. liberal arts education. Right. And it produced these men. And it's the kind of education that they could continue because they didn't work nine to five jobs. Now, certain times of the year, they might have worked six to ten jobs because, <laughs> you know, it's what you're doing. Yeah. You're planners yeah. or whatever. Harvest time is dust to dawn. Exactly. Or, I mean, uh, dawn to dusk. Dawn to dusk, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and granted, you know, when you're in the South and you're a slaveholder, they're doing most of that for you, but not everybody had huge plantations. Um, although many of the, obviously the, the big thinkers we talk about did. Um, we, we acknowledge that. Yeah, and that, that we're going to get to that a little bit too, exactly. the economic issues. But, but uh, you're on these social ones and keep going. Unlike today, where everybody works 9 to 5, 8 to 6, whatever, all day long, Every day of the year, vacations notwithstanding. And as we talked about in show prep, you know, how difficult it is to find time to write. Uh, you know, because the schedule is the same and it's unending, it, it weighs you down. And oddly enough, at many times throughout history, when you weren't busy with the busiest thing you had to do yeah. during, uh, you know, harvesting time and planting and what have you, you had time for other things, especially during the winter. Right. Yeah, that's what said the yeah. winter. So. And... That gives you the time to think, and if you, you know, obviously the the dirt poor, they were it was still a hard scrabble existence for them as well, but this idea of of uh, of being able to continue that education, to develop these ideas is very important. And oddly enough, it wasn't just the rich and those who who were you know had the time. This is almost I don't want to say universal, but it's far wider. Because it is a very literate society by the time we get to the 1760s when this really picks up. Yeah, right. And that's important to remember, too. Right. Very, very literate. Um, and we mentioned the they held education to have value. High and, esteem, yeah. Yeah, and that there's a figure, uh, John Witherspoon, one of the uh, a Presbyterian minister who would end up founding what becomes Princeton, I think he founded it, but he was one of the early movers of what would become Princeton University. Right, New Jersey College initially, yes. And he's very influential across New England uh, and very, well, even beyond, because even Madison, I think, is one of his students. Oh, um, that's right. Yes, he is. Yeah. So even Madison's from Virginia, but they sent him to New Jersey for school instead of sending him to William and Mary and, and places like where Jefferson went. Uh, so he's exposed to these Presbyterian dissenting ideas, valuing scholarship and, and learning. So Witherspoon's a very influential figure in this socio-educational mix of these men a at this time. Right. This is also, um, you know, we start talking about the individual things. I mean, so I think that's a pretty good, uh, very broad look at the kind of people we're talking about, right? So, and we talked a little about King's, King Philip's War, and where things really start picking up is the Stamp Act. Now, the Stamp Act wasn't about the things you lick and put on an envelope. 
It yeah. was literally pretty much anything that was printed or official documents or just about anything. That Any was, even playing cards. Yeah, playing cards was so one. This is all the, the newspapers, which newspapers were a huge deal. Yes, yeah, so there are multiple England. newspapers in every city, unlike it is now, where it's practically just. You know, nobody has a newspaper. I mean, you have small towns, had their own newspapers. Uh, yeah, everything had to pay a tax if it was printed, including playing cards, which just boggles the mind. And now that was repealed very quickly. And a lot of these things they tried to tax were quickly repealed because it generated so much unrest. Right. And the point that, you know, Britain tr- kept trying to, to establish was, look, we have the right to tax you. Your hours, and the way they were set up, technically they were. Yeah, they and were. again, the idea being not just in King Philip's War, but then into the French and Indian War, the crowns insisting we paid the burden for protecting you, and the colonies' argument was twofold: one, no, you didn't. Uh, again, Franklin goes to Parliament; he goes to London and testifies in front of Parliament. Look, we as as colonies raised these militias ourselves, funded them ourselves to augment you. And talked about the dead. You know, you won because we supplemented what you were able to send over. And two, you're not giving us any say here. We're Englishmen too. We have no representatives in in your parliament. Right. And while it's true that, and this is some of the arguments that were made by the Brits, it's like, well... You know, not everybody who is a citizen has representation. But that's not entirely true either because the Americans then pointed out, well, but there's somebody who represents yes. them. Yes, that's right. I mean, there, there is nobody who represents yeah. us. There there is, I mean, even the House right. of Commons. There is no member for Pennsylvania. There is no member for Virginia. Right. But all these other areas in Britain have representation. If we're to be a part of you, we should have representation too. Right, right. And, and that's huge. That's a huge you, issue. You know, for us. Well, you know, and, and it's, oh, it goes back to the old, the old saying. You know, with rights come responsibilities. With privileges come responsibilities. You cannot divorce the two. No, you cannot. And right. that is exactly what was attempting to be happened. We we're going to make you bear the burdens, but we're not going to give you any of the benefits. Well, and, and the rights, and yeah. there, and it really, they were onerous burdens in that sense. Because you point out the, the colonies, Martin, as you pointed out, they they really do. Uh, pay a lot of this. They don't rely entirely on the largesse of England. And the thing that England doesn't understand, and the reason they don't understand is they don't see the bill. Yeah. All they see is, well, we sent you, you know, 25,000 men for the French and Indian War, and it cost us this much. Yeah. yeah. You didn't pay us for that. It's like, well, no, but you also didn't pay for the 25,000 men we sent. Yeah. So, yeah, and there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And there was, um, there was a another piece of this after the war, in that they had inducted a lot of these minor nobility as officers into the into the army, Mm -hmm. and it became kind of a political football in in London. What are we going to do with all of these guys? They're influential. We don't want to discharge them out of the army. They'll be PO'd. But we we're not actively fighting anywhere. And stationing them all here on the home front is politically unpalatable as well. Right. The war you're talking about is the French and Indian War. Right. After the French and Indian War, there's, you know, a couple thousand officers that they've got nothing to do with, but they don't want to run them out of the army. Might need them someday. Yeah. So they want to pay. So they sent them over here. Yeah. And they had to pay for their upkeep. Ah, And the Americans are going... Well, we don't want to pay for their upkeep. They're not doing anything over here. Right, because there's no there's nothing to do. There's, there's no wars here. There's, there's no nothing. enemies. Yeah, that was a huge, that would eventually become one of the huge, biggest sticking points. That was I mean, that becomes one of the amendments essentially right. that that right. Madison writes. Uh, you know, no no quartering soldiers in homes because that's what they basically did. Yeah. We've got all these officers, we don't want to discharge them. Because they're politically influential, but we can't station them at home. That's right. We're not going to put them in a stupid barracks, you know. Yeah. That's, so gonna, we're going to move them in. They're used to the high life. We're going to give them the high and life. And they're like, we don't want them to oh, with us. Yeah. Well, and you know that's an important thing to consider. How, we don't really talk about in history class at all how onerous an issue that was. Yeah. It was so onerous that, as you pointed out, Martin, they literally made it one of the amendments to the Constitution. That's right. So you have to wonder 
How bad was that? What were these Englishmen doing, these, these English officers doing? Because it wasn't just the fact they had to, to be quartered, because I'm sure many of them were quartered in, in, with very nice families who liked having the dashing young officer yeah. uh, around to be courted by the daughters. I was going to say diddling the daughters is where we're going to go. But, with this. Yes, yes, I'm sure very quickly it does turn into that. That's right. And or they, the mothers. Or the mothers. <laughs> or the grandmothers or any, uh, anything they can get their hands or, on. Or diddling the servants. That's correct. Or those who did not want to be diddled. That's well, yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. And there were no rights for such things in those days. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, there everything was the the woman was you know, was had nothing. Right. Yeah. And you know that's the sort of thing that because uh, when you look at the 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 on the surface the, the high level thirty thousand foot view, one can make the argument that the American Revolution is not a just war. Because if you look, well, the, you know, because the reason we talk about it is talk about the taxes. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's not really a good enough reason to go to war. Okay. You know, on, on its surface, because let's right. face it, it the ta- none of the taxes were terribly onerous. Yeah. Well, we we have created a cause mentality since yes. then, and we have anointed that as the ultimate arbiter of thou shalt not, you know, taxation without representation, blah blah blah. But you're right. If we can get rid of the 200 years of propaganda we as Americans have swallowed since birth, and look at it, yeah, look at it prima facie. You're right. That's not a reason for war. Is a tremendous. But the important solution. part of the phrase "taxation without representation" is, is the without without representation. Yes, because they really felt they had no say. That they yes, felt their rights were being trampled. And, that, on. and that's in the beginning. It was that. It got to the point later, though, because there were some backdoor discussions well into the war uh, uh, that were attempted to be made, and Franklin in particular says, hell no, we don't want representation now. It's too late. It's too late. 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 Yes. Once you make that declaration, it really is too late. You you burn. And that's an interesting thing because Franklin is better without. Without. Yeah. But they didn't know that at the beginning. But by the time. And and Franklin's one of the guys that leads that idea. That's right. One of the first ones. There were some that that were saying, no, wait a minute. You know, isn't that why we're fighting? Yeah. If they're going to give us that, then why would we continue fighting? And Franklin realizes, you know, that ship has sailed. Yeah. We are better and stronger than we thought we could be. By ourselves, yeah. yeah, and that's when you get into the ideas. This is uh, the genesis of Manifest Destiny is from there. It's like yeah. we're Americans; we're better than the English ever were, and will be. And you know, history does bear a little of that out. Yeah, well, in many I mean, ways, we rescued him twice. Uh, I was gonna say, <laughs> that's great. Pull there, you know. If it weren't for us, they'd all be walking around going Deutschland, Deutschland. It's <laughs> our allies. Yeah. In, in many uh, ways, well, no, we had, we had, we had advantages in many areas. Not just in natural resources and in land, but I think it was back to what you're talking mentality. about. The, yeah, the, is, is the American of... character was just very different. I mean, they, in the movie The Wind of the Lion, they talked about it. Teddy Roosevelt uh, by Brian Keith. It's Melius's words, but basically, yeah. we have too much audacity. Yeah, uh, which uh, and it makes us sometimes a little blind and reckless. Well, from the very beginning, you, as I talked about, when you send people over; they have to build everything from scratch. That, yeah, it's inevitable. You, you create a, a culture that says that we can do anything uh-huh. because we've done anything. That's right. We've done it. Yeah, yeah. We've carved out a space here. Now, granted, uh, yes, we we had to push some people out to do much of that. Well, it, it's more but complicated it's not, than that, though. Cause it is. We 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 coexisted a lot too. We did coexist a lot. Yeah. But ultimately, uh, by the time we get to the to the to the revolution, yes, we have pushed out the the native uh, native peoples from the from uh, what to, the, to, the, for a great for the. Not the entirety of the colony lands, but to a great extent, they have been pushed into what will become the new states after the war. Yeah, Ohio, some of that. Yeah. They almost there were, of course, uh, a lot of it was part of the war itself because yes. the tribes themselves, those who were allied to the French, were definitely moved out by this time. But those who were allied to the British stayed and yeah. stayed allied to them. Talk about the Mohawks and others, and. We basically, as part of the war, and this was Washington, one of those little dirty things that Washington you know, talked about, he was known as the home burner because he came through and literally wiped out tons of them because that's where a lot of the resistance was coming from, was uh, was from these Native Americans allied to the, to the British. Uh, and he had to go back years later uh, and, I don't want to say apologize, but it's kind of like trying to make peace with that. Yeah. Because that made, but war creates But he understood that that was... 
That was the tactic that would work. That's right. right. And it did work. It absolutely worked because yeah. there well, was no that's, more... That's the only way to get rid of guerrilla warfare, that's unfortunately. Exactly is it is, yes. Burn the guerrillas out of their homes. And that's exactly what he did, yes. so But right. I, mean, I don't want to take us too far afield. No, no. But, but I mean, but though the, it, it illustrates, though, that... Uh, it helps to illustrate, though, that um, while there were people here, they didn't have the... the it's partially technology. It's partially the societal structures... They didn't have the infrastructure yeah. that the colonists built, right. because the colonists come from a, for lack of a better term, more civilized setup, and so they want to replicate that. Right, right. the ability to go from town to town over a road. Right, right. Well, yeah, and they also had different understanding of who could own things. Yeah, you know, right. To the to the natives, owning land is not the same kind of concept. You can occupy it. But you don't own it and pass it on to your children the same way that the right. Well, do. you're you're moving to follow the game. Yes. You know you're you're packing up and moving. They're not farmers yet. Yeah. yeah. Not in the sense that that the Americans small scale bring. small scale farming, but and they would just pack up and go somewhere else and farm somewhere else. Yeah. If the land got where it wasn't productive, which anymore. was semi nomadic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, and, and that's something that. Was very antithetical. Right. They came over. They wanted to. All right, this plant, is where we're going to be. We're going to plant our flag, and we're going to put put down roots. Here. Yeah, because yeah. what we've discovered, there's not enough for everybody. So we each have to have our pieces. So we have to del- clearly delineate what is our piece and what is your piece. Right. And therein that enshrines that in law, which is the only way to do this and and maintain the peace. Yeah. And that uh, ultimately the two the, the two cultures were the clashes that happened there yeah. were inevitable. It was, but anyway. But the point is though that they, they, they came and they built this, yeah. and just, they figured out they could do anything, and this it just becomes part of the American character, and I think it was inevitable looking back. Yeah. From the moment you start establishing colonies all along the coast, they're going to break. It's just it's inevitable. Well, uh, from, back, the, from the mother country. Yes, from the, from the mother country. Okay. Yes. Uh, because of who you sent, how you send them, and what they do once they get there. And once they get to a certain point where they are truly self-sufficient, not just in goods and the ability to feed themselves, but to be able to export. Yes. That's the point of no return. That's a good lead-in for what I'd like to talk about next. All right. What's our time right We're now? We're at 20-something. Let's so do think, a bourbon break. I think this is a good a good interrupting spot to do a bourbon break, and then I want to talk uh, economic factors. Yes, because that is good, important. I, well, I, and I don't want to lose this, too, because I'm going to come back to some uh, implications of what we've just been talking about. Yes, yes, that's so important, well. too. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right, so... Uh, Martin, you have poured all three of us the same bourbon, correct? Yes. yes. Correct. So this is Monk's Road. Tell us a little bit about okay, Monk's so Road. Okay, so this is Monk's Road Small Batch, um, the Dant family. That's correct. Uh, opened a new distillery in Gethsemane in Nelson County. Just a few uh, which, miles from where I was born and raised. So, of course, Gethsemane is the home of a uh, monastery. Trappist. Yes. Trappist Monastery. Trappist the Cistercians, actually. They are a contemplative order. They've been there since 1849. So, yeah, uh, and Cistercians the, the, are the famous, important in history. Uh, there are a couple of popes that were Cistercians. Well, there there were. I mean, they're they're French order originally. Yes. Uh, but the the most famous Bernard individual, of Clairvaux, I believe. Bernard, good, very good, sir. I am very impressed. I noticed that. I'm yes. reading Dan Sa- Jones uh, books, The Crusaders, uh-huh. yeah. and Bernard uh, of Clairvaux focuses. He is one of features very prominently in the history of. The Templars yes. and of the Crusades. Saint yes. Bernard, actually, yes. and he is extremely important in that time. And yes, that, that's there, there's roots from there. Uh, the mo- uh, the modern Cistercians have been there, and they're still very very thriving in this area. I've been to that uh, that monastery many many times. Uh, but the most famous uh, modern Cistercian there is the, is the uh, spiritual sage Thomas Merton. Yes, which, which is, is very well known to Bellarmine folks. Yeah, yeah, all of his papers are there. Uh, yes. that, that, that his yes. library and all that, because he was a prolific Occupies writer. Occupies the upper floor of the library. Yeah, he has is, his own space. Yeah, it, he is one of the most prolific spiritual writers. Uh, his most famous novel is The Seven Story Mountain, which is, other than St. Augustine's Confessions, is probably the most famous story of conversion ever written. You could put those two on par with each other. Yeah. Yes. It's a gazillion bestseller, still continues to sell. Anyone who ever converts to Catholicism in particular, so many of them read through that and find uh, meaning 
yes. with that. It's it's an amazing book. If you, uh, I encourage readers to read it. It's, it's a spiritual classic, uh, and has been for a long, long time. Excellent. So, so yes, yeah, so Nelson County, Gethsemane area, yeah. the Dant family, who goes way back with bourbon, is yeah, open a new which distillery. Are, which there's, I have some relations through their yes. marriage and stuff uh, like that. And uh, they're literally, you could hear it, uh, the new the new concert space they put out there. You can hear that when they have concerts from my parents' home. Oh wow! Yeah, that's right. And and, I, and our dear friend uh, uh, Maverick is what he's asking us to call him. By the way, uh, you can hear it from his uh, from his place. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. So that's a good description for him. So, yeah, yeah, so he, he requests it. So log, log Steel Distillery. Uh, this is Monk's Road Small Batch. There's also a Monk's Road 5th District, which is a little higher level. And it's I had some of that $80 with, $80 with Maverick this week, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? he, had, he, he, nice. he, he, he is a big fan of this as well. And I told him that we would be featuring it on this next week. What is the, uh, the mix of this? So this is a weeded bourbon. So uh -huh. wheat will factor into the mash bill okay. fairly high. And that gives it kind of that mellowness and softness mm -hmm. uh, with some with some additional sweetness. So you're yeah, not going to get you get immediately. Oh, yeah. So you're not getting yeah, you rye. Uh, you're not getting pepper and and all that. Really, so I'm feeling a bit of a, a pepper I'm thing in the pepper. back of the mouth. I'm yeah. getting some pepper. That's yeah. I, I am. But it's, you're right. It's not that rye. No, it's I, definitely not rye. Yeah. It's 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 a smoother, it's sweet sweet pepper. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, uh, that, that sounds almost um, oxymoronic. Love that I always word? feel like uh, I think it has almost like an apple flavor up front, kind of a fruit flavor up front, and then a cinnamon finish is the way I described it early on when I was first trying it. I, I, I would not like disagree with that. Uh, I'm not I sure I get the cinnamon part because to me that, that that's peppery the, bit that, that, is just overpowering anything after the sweetness. I think he's talking about cinnamon not from the sweet side but from the hot side. Like, uh, 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 just like that a cinnamon tiny stick. bit. Yeah. Tiny bit of like a cinnamon be, candy yeah. you know, the, you know, uh, if, if, a, a cinnamon piece of candy sometimes is just is hot. Right. right. That's, yeah, that, red hot has that. Yeah. That's the type of cinnamon. Just a touch of it on the finish. Um, but again, very super mellow, nice and woodsy. That wheat, uh, yeah. you know, the, gives uh, it that kind of mellow it softness. It blooms real well we, uh, with these uh, with these large ice cubes you provided us. Here yes, like spherical ice cubes for the win. Yes, Thanks, Robert. very much. Yeah, it, it works really well. Um, it it hangs around in the mouth uh, quite a bit. Um, yes. you know, most of, most bourbons you can feel go down or you know where it'll hang out in the chest. But yeah. to me, while I do feel that. Uh, it, it, it really does hang around in the back of the mouth. Yeah, the back definitely. Of the top. Definitely. Um, I kind of wish it were a little bit sweeter in, the, in that bit, or at least just not quite so so peppery, the cinnamony, whatever. Well, yeah, that's, that's a better but, but taste. It's a, it is, it yeah. is. But it, it is such a good flavor, though, when you drink. Oh, it is. It is. It's, 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 very, it's very flavorful. Very yeah. mature. Yeah. It, it, not, not necessarily in its, its creation, but the flavor is mature. It's something that, as adults, we get. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't. I, you know, it's, it's something that you know you could, a young person, if they, even if they could even choke it down, wouldn't wouldn't appreciate that. Well, you know, it's same thing with us. Uh, I think it's the evolution of how we have gone with bourbon. We, obviously, we started when we were relatively young. We were in our twenties. Yeah, that's when right. we, we started drinking bourbon, and we didn't do it very often. And you know, foolish us, yeah. you know, we did mixers on bourbons that should never have been mixed. But it's how we were introduced. It's how we could. Acquire well, the taste, yeah, uh, and I think probably a lot of the uh, that's going to be true for a lot of people to develop the palate mm -hmm. to be able to truly appreciate bourbon takes time, as in, as it is intended to be. Well, yes, I mean, partially that's just you know understanding the flavor, but I mean just being able to you know it really. I'm a year and a half past drinking soft drinks all the time, yeah. so and I definitely now have gotten to the point where I am. Tasting all these flavors that Martin was talking about, you know, thinking I don't know where he's pulling this stuff out of his ass, but you know, it's it's there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, I'm sure now that you have given up soft drinks, Francis. Well, yeah, more that your palate well. will uh, be it, it will is. Be uh, yeah, I'm not returning. I'm not craving the sweetness that I once was, and I think that was a yes. detriment. It is. It, that is really a huge hurdle. Yeah, and and, 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 I, and I do want to I do want to make sure I lay it out too, though that you know there is no uh, if you. There's no wrong way to consume bourbon. There's many, many other well, ways. Well, there's one to, wrong way. Which way? Not, not, the mint julep. 
<laughs> mint julep. I mean, I, I know you, I'm still not sure why you're hating on the mint juleps. You know, I'm trying to think about that. Cause well, it's one, it's pretentious. Two, it's nasty. And two, it's nasty. Really? Well, well no, honestly, I, and that's three what I understand. For tourists. And it's for tourists. Well, I mean, I get the last I mean, one. I've never really had a mint julep, but just the description of how it's made just sounds nasty to me. I would submit that if you get one that is made with the fresh mint, with the right type of ice, uh, and made well, I think there's an appreciation to that. It is very different. It is very different. I'd rather just have a bourbon and ginger. If I want to mix my bourbon with something sweet, then simple syrup. Just do a bourbon and ginger. Yeah. Much easier. Well, and that's another thing. I think we, I think we miss the point so much. We talk about bourbon with you know with either straight, neat, or with ice. There are some really great cocktails that can be made with bourbon. That's yeah. true. Oh, we, and yeah. I think we do a disservice is, is to that good. sometimes. Um, the old fashioned is, is the easy one, and yeah. that's the one that's that's so common without there. Oh, the Long Island, Island iced tea is an excellent one, and please don't go back into our history. Over that one, uh, <laughs> because that's the one that got me awful sick that one time. But it, it's so, they're so easy to... Yeah. See, now you've ruined me for the rest of the episode, because I'm just going to have that image of you in, in my mind now. And I won't tell the story, because we've told it on the show before. But, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Yes, yeah, needs to say, it was a... But it was, a, a verdict uh, on Monk's Road, what do you think? Oh, abs- oh uh, primo. Absolutely, number one. Uh, hey, I, this is a... If you catch it right, I got it for 38, but it's usually closer to 50. Yeah. Uh, yes, I've seen it. Monk's yes. Road Small Batch. Um, and again, it's not the Monk's Road 5th District, which is more of an $80 uh, dollar bottle. But uh, yeah. if you can catch this right, it's a very similar price point and to it, it's Basil, big, uh, uh, to um, Yellowstone Select, and, right. the, and to some of the uh, Old Foresters. And it's it's right there with them, I think. The, the name comes from, and I, I'll, I'll do a little bit of this here just for a second. The name actually comes from, that's what they call the road leading up to the monastery is Monk's Road. It's Monk's Road. And literally between the distillery and the monastery is one straight road. That's Monk's Road. Monk's so that's road. where the name came from. Yeah. Ironically, the Dant family, my grandfather worked for them back in the, back in the 40s yes. at that distillery, which was closed for a long time. Uh, after that, and is now, that's what they're operating out of. They sold off their brand, J.W. Dant. Yes. Which was... Heaven the, Hill owns it now. Yeah, they right? sold that back... In, exactly. And they're, they're making it. So, ironically, the Dant family cannot make whiskey, bourbon, under their own brand. <laughs> under because their own they name, sold yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, they, that's why the name Monk's Road. Yes. Because I suspect if they had the opportunity to take that, that brand back, they would. But yeah. it's always been a fairly decent seller. From what yes, I understand, yes. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a, well, we've never know, featured it on the show, which J. we probably Dan. should. But yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the thing about bourbon, it it really is the recipe. It is, and while recipes can be copyrighted, uh, every time you go to a new place and you do bourbon, uh, and especially back in the day before things got so scientific, yeah, you know, every batch is going to be a little bit different, right? Uh, so I'm sure that the Dant family has uh, taken that 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 core idea. And tweaked it some so yeah. that they're not in trouble with it. Yeah, and you know they're doing a new, yeah, yeah. Uh, a new way of doing it. Exactly, and and to be honest, I suspect you know, this is. The, now I'm just going by price point here. This is a higher price point than, than the JW is. That's more like a Woodford price. Point. It is. I think they've improved. I think they've taken this and gone to that to that level right. where I, yeah. I suspect. I mean, they I really be. feel like this is a, a unique flavor uh, among the, at, at this price point. I. So I'm totally sold on Monk's Road. Very I much really so. And that's kind of what I wanted the to The only sure. thing I'm disappointed with is the damn cork broke in the bottle. Uh, Never uh, seen this before. before. Yeah. So I'm, I'm having to use a substitute wine bottle cork to, to seal up my Monk's Road again. So, yeah, because we can't drink it that fast. Yeah, work, <laughs> yeah, work, but, on, work but, on that, Dan family. Get uh, get some better cork yeah, sourcing. Just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. I'm sure that, they probably would want to know that sort the of thing. The cork right. broke. Yeah. You know, because you want your cork to be snug, but you don't want it to be that snug. That's right. Yeah, it would. Uh, so. And, you know, it's not like champagne where, you know, the, the cork then expands once it hits air again, that you can't get those. You have to drink champagne in one sitting. Yeah, it will not go back. Right. But with bourbon, you know, unless you're having a party, that cork's going back in the bottle. Well, yeah, it's, it's meant to be consumed over time. I mean, because yes. I mean, it does not, uh, uh, opening it does not affect yeah. it at all. If anything, it may even improve it with the, yes. with the air in the direction. This is a, quite the great sipper bourbon. I mean, it is. It really is. Well, I told him that fellow, what was his name? Sam? Sam? At the, at the Fraser? Oh. At, at, uh, the, at the testing, yeah, I think you're was right. Sam, yeah. yeah. You know, so I, he wanted, what's your go-to? 
I said, well, right this minute, it's this monk's road. Because it's just, to me, it's a, it's, it's a wow. It it's is. It's a real it really wow is. flavor. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the best we've done. Yeah. And yeah. we've done a lot of good ones. We have, yeah. And uh, Robert and I have already finished ours. So yes. That's, so it's, it's one of the really things I do like about this is that even though it's got that, that peppery finish in the back of the mouth, it doesn't hang around as as much as the yeah. one we did the last yeah. time we were here. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, we did one that was very peppery. Rebel 100, probably. Was that what it was? Okay. Yeah. That sounds right, um, yeah. And this one fades, whereas the other one really hung around. It colored the rest of my day. Uh, so this, you know, and I don't want that. You know, I wanted to enjoy it in the moment, but I don't want it to, to flavor everything else afterwards. Yeah. So, which is good. Which is good. Yeah. All right, so back to the revolution. We did 13 Great. minutes on bourbon. <laughs> I love that. So, yes. Well, we ec- had reason. We these, had reason. These, these economic factors. So, we, you know, yes, the social factors are very important. But there, there's some serious economic stuff going on here too. There are, and yes. it's very, to me, it's very interesting in that the economic interests of the colonies are not really united. They're, they're very that, that, disparate. Right. They, they should be, you'd think. But well, no, not really, because but, but, yeah. because you've got the agrarian South and the mercantilist North, and they are they are they're just different. Oh, I agree, I agree on it's that. A, I was thinking, and maybe I'm wrong with you, what you're saying here, with Britain. Yes. Well, yes. yes. Yeah, that's yes. what I'm saying. So, it's, it's, so you know, of course, they're, you know, they, the intention was that we're all one people, and we're you're just our arm that does this, this, and this. But ironically, the, the interests, as I think you're going here, became very different. Yeah, again, the, the, the North is, and mercantilism is, is the right word. That's, that's kind of the word for the economic system of Britain before, before kind of Adam Smith and the idea that because no, this is pre-industrial revolution. Yes, it's very yes. important. We so there this is, is not a there's, manufacturing society. Yeah, right? I mean yeah. It's, there's very limited manufacturing going on in the north. It's it's craftsmanship. But there is some, stuff. Yeah, it's craftsmanship. Yeah. So printing is huge, business is huge, sale and trade and and. Of course, there is some agriculture, but it's much more of a seasonal. Well, yeah, you know, sure, and, that's, and, that's and why, it's exporting it's why, natural bourbon, resources. Yes, yes. that's why yes. bourbon came about. And I mean, shipbuilding. It's, it's I mean, shipbuilding. Yes, shipbuilding in New England is is huge. It's a big deal. Huge. It's a big deal because Britain is building ships, but they're also contracting for ships being built in New England. Right. But the South's economic interests are completely agrarian, really. Yes. And focused. Especially early on on tobacco, yes. even more so than cotton. Yes. Cotton does not become really king. You know, king cotton yeah. is king. That's not until later. Right. That's not until the gin, the cotton gin, the engine. Well, yeah, because it was too labor intensive. Even, even yes. with uh, forced servitude, slavery. It's, yeah, you, it's that's the whole yeah. reason slavery rose and became in such a demand in the South is because cotton was so labor intensive. Right, and cotton, the cotton gin made it where you could make money. Off of cotton, finally, right. because even even with slave labor, it was so hard to separate. Mm-hmm. Now with the gin, you could have the slave labor harvesting and then the gin separating and making it work. But tobacco and what Britain did that really aggravated the colonists is limited tobacco exports from the colonies just to Britain. And they, also, they couldn't sell to the Dutch. They couldn't sell to the French. Couldn't sell to anybody. Well, which uh, that was their thumb. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, well, and it, uh, it goes both ways. The colonies weren't allowed to import from anybody except, except Britain. Britain, and that's huge because they're they're still bringing in a lot of goods because they can't make everything yet. Yes. Yeah. They can yeah. make most things and they need. That became a big sticking point too. Is yes. the debt that a lot of people incurred buying things from Britain? These these merchants in London would. Yeah, sure, Mr. Washington. Sure, Mr. Jefferson. We'll sell you linens and silver and all this other stuff on credit. Yes, and at an inflated price yes, as well. And, and because there's no competition. Right. You know, there's a huge irony here uh, because the, you know you're talking about this is in the 1760s, 70s, 50s, whatever. Uh, the very thing that Britain is doing to its own colonies, that thumb it's putting on there to keep them down, is exactly what Britain would rail against during the time of Napoleon. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. continental system, the which continental Napoleon system. turned around and says, we shall not buy British goods 
anywhere on the continent. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, my, my respect for the Brit- Brits of the period has gone down a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, and the more we study these things, because they really were, we will enrich ourselves on the backs of whoever we need to. Yes. yes. And it was it was the industrial... Well, it's empire. That's it, the point of it, empire. But that's exactly right. And that's... Yeah. And in many respects, that was Germany's argument against them. See, look at these imperial... You know what? Even though they're copying them, mind you, trying to. Yeah. But the, so much of the German intellectual, I'm going to get off subject. Well, and by the time the Revolution War comes along, you know the the, the monarchs are German. That's right. Exactly. So, <laughs> so it's, it's you're trying to figure out. You know, this is th- what they're doing. This imperial colonialism. It is not just wrong. It is heinous. Yes. Heinous. And it's that right. is part of the dissatisfaction, to put it mildly. Yeah. Of the Americans, the colonists, because that same attitude. Is what they put on us. What they live with, yeah. yeah they so live we with. we so, will subjugate you. And it, the, the thing that economically that, that, that is very important to remember, because I think this goes back to the American character, is that the Americans just don't lie down and take this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. They become pirates and smugglers. That's right. They we're not gonna and, take it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so you know, from the very beginning. The colonists are nonconformists. Yeah. yeah. Which, and willing to risk their lives at it. Because being a pirate that was a smuggler, their origins. that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah, I mean, their origins they were nonconformist. So, right. that, you know, Britain really kind so, of made right. their and own bed and then they ended up laying The there. social nonconformity would translate into an economic nonconformity as well. Yeah. Right, because at this time, and, and almost in, you know, until the modern age, nobody could regulate trade in the sense that yeah. Britain was trying. So what I found very interesting in researching this is, again, with these very disparate economic interests, Britain still managed to piss off all the colonies. Yes. You know, it's like... Yeah, essentially... You'd think that maybe one section they'd favor... And maybe that section wouldn't be so upset. Or that's but what, they really managed yeah. to piss off yeah, everybody. You would think sooner or later they, they would have had to have been a symbiotic relationship between them and uh, and and at least some portion of us to say, wow, we we're all winning here. Yeah. And you well, and, and if if Britain had if they could have gotten past their damned imperial mindset, it's not. I don't think it's an imperial mindset as much as it is this, because it, it, that's part of it. Yeah. But the thing that the colonies do not have, that the Brits do have, is not just representation in the House of Commons. There are no lords in the colonies. There's no one here that represents the same kind of interest that England has at, yeah. on so, the home front. So you're There's suggest- also it's- the idea... Hold on, this is, this is part of it. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, because all of the colonies were founded by the power and granting of the king... Yes. And at the time, the monarchs in England were still quite powerful. Yes. And so the monarchs, George especially, is looking over here and saying, this is mine. It always has been, yes. And he did take it as been. kind of a personal insult. Yes, yes. Exactly. Which, which was very short-sighted of him. But monarchs always take things yeah. as a per- That's the problem with monarchy. It's, yeah. it, I think that's where you're going with this. The monarchical system that spawned the colonies was ultimately what doomed the... Yes, doomed that's why I say it's inevitable. Yes, yes. I, I totally agree with the that. The United States is Thanos. We are inevitable. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're right, because in, the, the monarchical system was already outdated... But we're not that evil. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah. Parliament, the, the rise of Parliament was one of those ways yes. uh, that, that showed that it was an attempt to adapt, but it did not adapt fast enough where uh, popular rule ultimately was inevitable. Exactly. It had to be. Because... Through, through, a, through the proper system of checks and balances, of yeah. course. Yes. Now, if they, had, if they had appointed lords over here, the break might not have happened as soon. I still think it would have happened, but... I, yes, their, own, I mean, their own snobbery prevented that. Yeah, yes. I mean, if you make That's Thomas right. Jefferson, you know, Duke of Virginia, yes. does he have the same interest in breaking away? Absolutely not. Because being a Duke has a lot... Because he's Duke of not just Monticello. Yeah. He's Duke of the entire frickin' colony. Yeah. That's a much bigger deal. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they kind of started that with George Calvert. 
you know, early on in Maryland, but it, things didn't stay that way. But yeah, be, things don't stay they, that way. They became and governors, point, and then they became, and then other things, all of a sudden, it's now popularly elected governors. And now, right, there's you, no hereditary there's, aspects. There's no hereditary aspects, and there's no crown appointment. Yes, well, sort, there, of, sort kinda, of, kind of, but that well, was that one of the reasons. That, you know, that's one of the reasons of the break, too, yeah, is yeah. originally it had been, yeah, you colonists, you could pick your own leaders. Right. And then the Brits tried to uh, force onto them these appointments of royal governors. Right. And it was a lot of friction. Well, well and, and those land grants well. were still coming by royal decree. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So you've got, it, it's a polyglot. It really yeah. is. Um, but I mean, but it, that happened in Pennsylvania, that happened in the south of, yeah. okay, no, you're not going to get to do like a locally elected guy. We're going to send this guy over. It happened in Massachusetts as well. He's going to run the place. Yeah. Well, and, and he's going to run the place with the crown's interest, not necessarily your local. interest. And yes. he's bringing troops with him because he's usually a military guy. Right. So this and is if where there is a out. duchy of Virginia, for instance, then somebody like a Jefferson or a Washington, whomever, or even if they split it up more and said, and you know, Duke yes, of Piedmont, Duke up. of Allegheny, or Duke, or you know. Kent. Yeah. Probably more likely. Yes. Yeah, because dukes usually infer royal relations. Yes. They don't yes. usually give yeah. those titles. Earl, then they would have been just, Earl. There, there are many, yes. there are many yes. Earl of Monticello, the, the Earl, Earl of Piedmont. Of Piedmont. Yeah, there's a lot of those. So, but if they had done that, then whoever were the counts would have been, had, a, had they would have had a foot in both, world, both they, worlds. Yeah, because they would have really had an investment in the status quo. Exactly. And they would there would have been much more influence over how things got taxed and influenced yes. over here, and because there is this this opposition in how they want to rule it, rule themselves versus how Britain wants to rule, you know, one of the reasons I didn't re- even realize this. One of the reasons that the six states that we call New England today are called New England is because the charters, the colonial charters, were revoked, and all of them were just called New England, one big colony. Yeah. Is the way it was was chartered, and that didn't last long because of all the crap that was going on. And yeah. those those colonies were rechartered. Yeah, but that's yeah. why there is a New England that blew my mind. I did not realize. I just thought it was a, a, just a regional name. No, it was actually a political entity at one time. <laughs> yeah. So, Robert, are we ready to sum up? Oh my gosh, gosh, we're Summing fifty. Up, how do we we're sum at 50 up? Fifty minutes. So yeah, you know, I think our yeah, initial these, points. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're these social things. The the. New learning, new education, plus everybody's already a dissenter anyway. Right. They're already somebody who's been in friction with the crown to begin with. Whether right. it's Scro- Scots Presbyters that have been kicked out after the 45, or Maryland Catholics. 1632. Or, yep. Yeah. Or, or the, Puritans. the Puritans in New England. And, and so Absolutely. they're already at odds with the crown anyway. They have this history. Well, and it's and not then necessarily they're... the individual people at the time of the revolution. But that's the mother's milk on which they embody. Yes, yes. And yeah, then, because you're about you're about three or four generations yeah, removed from at any least. of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Depending on when the yeah. founders. But it's 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 a carrying down tradition. It is of of being at odds with the because crown. there's no British. But the forty five is only fifteen years. Right, but I mean, there's still there, there's no British uh, efforts at supplanting this. There's no British effort to make uh, the world England. As Pardon? they say, make the world England. That was their motto at the time. But they didn't. That's not what. They, but that's not what they meant about it. They that's meant right. make England own everything. There is a huge difference between making everything England and England owning everything. There is. It's a and that that's yeah. and England owning everything is what they took to the world, not the other way around. And they made no effort at making them English. They just said, "All right, here's your charter. You owe fealty to us." And as far as they were concerned, that's all we're done. That, that, well, because the, done. the purpose, their only purpose was was cash, cash cow. Yeah, I mean for for well, Britain, prestige. Yeah, yeah I mean for correct, Britain, yeah. there was two purposes. There was one: we're getting rid of a troublesome crew, whether it's Scottish Highlanders that you know the only ones that Butcher Cumberland didn't kill and kicked out to the Carolinas, or Catholics or whoever these oddballs are. We're getting rid of them, and again the trade. For the economic interests. That's right. Yes. So that was uh, that was their own. That's the only thing Britain cared about. It and, was very insular. Yeah, and, 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 and like said, there was no interest in their political rights. No interest in 
granting them any kind of equity or equality they at really all. They really didn't want, they, they wanted to use them, but they did not want to embrace them. Yeah. Right. Well, oh, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's a very exactly good way to phrase it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, to their mind, there couldn't be nobles in America because your nobility is partially tied to your land. Yeah. And this is all new land, and you know, new nobles are not not a big. Thing. Well, that dilutes the power of the existing and nobles. It dilutes so the power of the existing nobles. You can't have that. Can't yeah. So there's a vested interest here. Yeah. In the yeah. Status quo. So, that's why. So, that's why the entire concept of ever truly quote unquote embracing them would never fly. Exactly. Too many yeah. oxes would be gored. Yeah. Too so, far too many. So there's your social causes. Then you know the economic causes. Again, there's there's a lot of economic interest, but it's all being stomped on by Britain. Again with. Restriction of trade to only with Britain. Um, these stamp duties and taxes that are supposed to pay for defense, but the colonies are arguing, well, we've already paid for our own defense. You're not doing anything except leaving these officers over here to piss us off. And diddle our daughters. Yeah. It's a very, very good phrase. I like that. And then there's... Well, it came from you, so... I, you know, this milieu of these genius guys, again... Hamilton, Washington, John Adams, Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, uh, William Randolph, um, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Imagine having all of these guys in the same place. And and Franklin really being kind of the thought leader the whole time. Yeah, the elder statesman. You know, he's the guy, that, again, that first one to go. He does not get the credit he deserves. I, I don't think so. He I does don't not. Think so. He is seen today as a buffoon, and that's wrong. That's right. Yeah. Uh, an inventor. And, you know, all of the... Eccentric. A tinkerer. Eccentric. And all these other things. He... But he... Had more to do with the creation of the United States yes. than people realize. Yes. Uh, he was there every, every, every step of the way. Well, it's like even just, Wikipedia says that Jefferson largely wrote the Declaration. That is not true. Jefferson, Franklin, and I forget the third guy's name. Um, yeah. They I mean, did it together. They did it yes, together. Jefferson did the final draft. Yes. But well, he did it because they had been working on draft after draft, and they said, all right, this is what we wanted to say. Tom, sum and, it up. You know, put they it in they deferred to Jefferson's ability to, to write, to, 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 to say, frame to, the yes. language, but it was a lot of Franklin ideas. Yeah. And again, Franklin's the guy, he's one of these very unique guys that sees beyond the single colony. Yes. Jefferson sees Virginia, but Franklin has traveled as postmaster. Throughout the colonies. Yes. So he understands Virginia, but he also understands Pennsylvania, New York. He understands... And he understands the Maryland, Prince, South it was, Carolina. He was basically the ambassador there. Yeah. Um, and he... So he is one of these very leading citizens. A very self-made guy. And wow. understands the power of the printed word at the same time. Because that's what he grew up as. That's a right. printer's apprentice. Right. That's brilliant. Yes. And... You take all of that. There's no one thing that you can point to and say, this is why the revolution happened. Yeah. It really is a mix of all of these it's things. complicated. Yeah. And not yeah. the Thank least... Thank you, Trevor Slattery. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you, brother. Hey, yes. Hey, it's complicated. Uh, and not the least of which is is this character that they that the Brits yeah. un, unknowingly and blindly helped build. Mm-hmm. Because you know, while they're small, they don't care about us. Yeah, they don't care about the colonies because it's just a way to just a place to ship people, and say, all right, you know what? Let's open it up some more. Uh, you guys really know us. Hey, how about you guys go over here now? Yes, because we'll give you a little bit of land, which we can't give you here because it already already owns yeah. it, and get you out of our hair. And whatever and, you build or make or whatever, we're the only market for it. Yes. Well, and that actually comes later. Yeah, and that's partially because you know England with that huge navy—they're the biggest navy in the world. They can impose that as best as they, they can, can enforce it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And but I think that that American character—it begins from the, it's there from the beginning. And this is not something that Americans fall into. It's who we've always been. Yeah, is individuals <coughs> working for the betterment of all. all right. So I've got one more question for you guys, though. Um, at, we're at 58 minutes here, so we'll, we'll have to answer this quick. But was George really all that bad? Oh, oh wow. well, I mean, we called him a tyrant. We we had all of these beefs with him. That was, but was that he was really a, all that? No, that bad? was a that was by, a, that was by a, modern a, standards. No, no, it was a construct 
that was no difference than uh, than us calling the Germans the Huns. It was a form of propaganda. Yeah. Uh, and well, it, he, it is it is he wasn't a little bit us. nuts though. Well, that's correct. I mean, there's there's not. Uh, that wasn't as generally known in this time. That no, began, but I think that contributes to his his almost monomania with how he's treating the, yeah. the colonies. It, it does, and certainly it's easy for us on this side of history to justify it, saying, see, 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 all along he was nuts, so therefore yes. all what he was doing. So it's kind of yeah. a little bit of retroactive uh, changing but on he that. Was, he was, he acted within the bounds of British tradition, very much so, and he, as which it as doesn't British, it right but as British monarchs but it, go, it he was restricted one, him. He was yes. one of the more successful yeah, of yes. the British monarchs. He he brought in a lot of great things for Britain. If you look at it from yeah. a British from a British, but if you think about centric, you know Central European monarchs, yeah, they would have dealt with a rebellion very differently. They'd have just burned the whole place down. That's well, but that's right. just the thing. They would have failed even bigger than George did. You can't burn down the 13 colonies. There's not enough he, manpower. They'd have, they'd have tried. They'd have tried. They'd have tried. Right. But you can't burn an idea. And you can't burn an idea. That's right. Yeah, it, it would. They, they would have been harsher. They would have been Tarleton. Yeah, yeah I mean, yes. it would have been Tarleton on, on a, on a uh-huh. huge scale. That's exactly, exactly right. right. That's where that would go. Huge that scale. Was... And we'll talk about him in another episode. But, yeah. but exactly. yeah, it, so yeah, maybe he wasn't the tyrant that we... that in, Certainly not the tyrant the way we think of it. But they, they but, felt him that I mean right because, and the reason the reason I think because I, this is a, this is a great question Mark I think it's a great summary question we're gonna take more than the two minutes um, but the reason that uh, the the colonies looked on him as a tyrant is that by the time 1775 rolls around which is really when everything starts yeah yeah the I mean, they're, true they're, separation yeah I mean they're deliberately using military force yes now to impose. What they had just done through political means in the past, right? So by the time seventeen seventy five comes around, they really are two people, and Remember, that's the it problem. It all started over trying to seize our guns. Yes, that is I very mean, true. Word to the wise, Lexington, and Lexington, and Concord. Word to the wise, they had started over. The Brits were on their way to seize guns. Just remember that. Yes, there there, there is a lot of truth to that. <laughs> Uh, now, granted, you know, you see somebody's guns, you seize their ability to feed their families back then. So yeah. that's a much bigger deal. But yes, it did start over seizing arms. Yeah, I mean, seizing the militia's uh, yeah. storehouse of firearms. So, but by the time this comes around, they, they, we really have become two different people. Yeah. That's, I think, what makes this a just war. Is you have, even though they come from the same roots, they share the same language, they share the same history, the two peoples are radically different at this point. They have diverged. Yeah. They yeah. have diverged. Yeah, the whole mindset is is yeah is just different. And, and this is and, a unique thing. This yeah. is one of the reasons why people have a hard time understanding the American Revolution. It, it truly, I think, in its, its true context, because it's not a civil war. Not in the, you know, it, it's not like the wars that have gone before it, and it's not like the revolutions that came after it. It's yeah. the only successful revolution, precisely because of all these things we've talked about. They're yeah. separate people. They, it's a different character. And it is not a class-based revolution. Almost all other revolutions are class-based. Yeah. I mean, this was this is the only middle-class revolution. Yes. You know, this is a middling landowners and merchant revolution. They never have it. They always love the status quo. Merchants love the status quo. Yes. Um, this is the only merchant and middle-class revolution. And... It works because of the character of these men who were willing to put aside, again, we mentioned this, their own ambitions yes. to form a new civil society. That we didn't really mention is it is really top of mind for them that they are establishing something completely new well, yes. and, and not done before in history. And they really felt that that was an important thing. They, they felt were, it was important and the thing that amazes me the most about this, you're right about setting aside their their uh, own personal interests, but you're right. They they set about to create a new country from the very beginning. It wasn't, let's have a war and then figure it out. They were figuring it out yeah. as they went along. Yeah. I mean, they really understood this idea of this is going to be completely new and we are in the a history country. of humanity. Yes. We're a country founded on an idea not just 
Well, we we were here in this place, and I mean that's part of it. Charlemagne said our tribe should be united. You know, no, it was we are a, we are Americans, not British, and that means we are going to form a government of the people, by the people, and for, for the, people. the people. You know, this this Republican ideal was very much right there from the beginning. It was in it was, every colony had that at the core of its government. Yeah. That cannot be understated either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did not choose individual kings for their colonies. They did not choose any kind of nobility. They all had... They were. It's kind of directed by, but it was also completely understood, that each colony would have its own constitution or governing document. Mm-hmm. And it was a Republican form. Little r. Right. Republican. Well, yeah. It, 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 it's, a, it's an anti-monarchical approach from the beginning. That was yes. a, a fait accompli uh, by the time it was finished. And then, that but would lead to friction reached, later. You know, yeah. that, people, that, was, that was a huge uh, smear on somebody to call them monarchical or right. monar- yeah, because, a monarchist. Yeah, because of you know, the, the backstory that brings with it. But they lo- looked back to Rome. Yeah, essentially, yeah. to the Roman I mean, Republic to say they this is accused. the better solution because yeah. since that time it really hadn't been done. Yeah, and that's when they yeah. well, even our form was different than, sure. than the Roman form. It had been yeah because it, I mean it, it was, was very heavily aristocracy. modeled on it. Yes, correct. But it was it, theirs was highly aristoc- aristocracy based, aristocratic, yeah. aristocratic, and we and that's another thing we rejected. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it was inherent and implicit, but we re- especially with the southern southerners. But it was explicitly rejected, right. even though it was implicit in the social structures of the southern colonies. Yeah. yeah. So, wipe it up. That was. Here's some information. <laughs> Shut up, Siri. That was excellent, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. That loved was, it. Yes, and that was a be, yes, fun, right. fun episode to work through. Yes, I absolutely. Because we really did cover all of those early bases. Again, the, the men. Their circumstances, the the social stuff, the economic stuff. We really answered the why. Is all all part of it, and you can't ignore any one piece. It's all crucial to what would eventually happen. It is. It really is. And again, it we, was we, need to, we need to do that some more too. I think in another episode is really talk about the mindset of these men. Again, from Alexander Hamilton to Samuel Adams, you know, mm-hmm. across mm-hmm. it. What informed them? What were they like? Interesting you should say that. Because next episode, we're going to do that. A little, but not quite, I think, the way he's talking about. A bit. A bit. A bit. bit. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about going much broader. But we're going to go into it in a microcosm anyway, because next episode is Code of Honor. And we're going to go to the Founding Fathers. If we want to understand them a little bit better, what better way than using their own Mm -hmm. words? Uh, And I'm sure we will touch on all that you're talking about here. In this next episode. So yeah, it's going to be great. Join us. Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes drop every second and fourth Friday at 6 a.m. Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms. And leave us a review. That helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next time.